morning and welcome to North Bedford Presbyterian on this second Advent Sunday. I have a few announcements from the pulpit here. Uh, first up, uh, the fellowship pads. If you had those on the outside of the pew, you could uh, pick them up, sign them, and set them toward the middle so everybody can sign in. Uh, December 13th is the late next chat and chew over at Miller's Ada House over in the corner of. Uh, Davis at the airport behind the room to go at 11.30. Uh, let's see. If you are interested in donating at Point Seda to the uh, to beautify the church, uh, please bring them on 18 December, two weeks from today. Uh, let's see. Anybody still wishing to uh, uh, pledge for the uh, this upcoming year for our church budget? Please, we have pledge cards in the back of the table. Please don't hesitate to sign up and come in the, in the offertory or community offertory plate. Um, just found that we uh, are setting all kinds of records around here, looks like, for uh, turning mint food into mana food bank. Just doing 345 pounds of food this week to turn into mana. That's a really good start. There's all we've got to need, I need especially this time of year, so. Keep them coming. I'm pretty sure we can get it to them in a timely manner. And finally, I have a plug here uh, for the next Sunday. Um, our anthem today is going to be out of our cantata. If you're interested in like what you hear, come on back next Sunday and we'll have a lot more for you. Are there any other announcements from the floor? There you can see none. Let's now require hearts and minds for worship.
our time of worship this morning. This truly is the day the Lord has made. We are going to rejoice and be glad in it. Let us begin by praying a prayer of praise and adoration for our time of worship. Let us pray. Precious Lord, by your Holy Spirit's direction and guidance, we come to you on this, the second Sunday of that event, to offer you our prayer and our praise and our preaching. Lord, we look back at the first advent when you first appeared on the scene as an infant baby. We now look forward to that second advent when you once again return, this time as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Lord, we come to you this morning to present our worship. May our worship be pleasing to you. May it give you all the glory and honor to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our call to worship today comes to us from Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. For he delivers the needy when they call, the poor and those who have no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy, and saves the lives of the needy. Blessed be you, Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glory and name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn is Prepare the Way, O Zion. Please stand if you're able for that opening hymn.
as we think about the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of joy. It is also called the shepherd's candle, reminding us that Jesus cares for us as the good shepherd. Light two purple candles. We're going to two purple candles now. When Christ comes into our lives, he brings the fullness of joy. His anoints our heart with the oil of gladness. Isaiah 61, verses 3. When Jesus was born, the angel said that his coming was good of great joy for all people. Luke 2 verses 10. Because Christ has come to us, we can live every day in the joy of the Lord. Praise to his name. as John the Baptist said in Matthew 3, to repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Let us confess our sins on this second Sunday of Advent for the coming of Christ. Let us pray. God of the prophets, we confess sometimes our lack of preparedness and our tendency to wander from you and your path that you've laid before us in your holy word. You call us to venture outside our comfortable places, yet we hunker down and excuse ourselves from faithful action. Forgive us, God. Call us again to your service, to repentance. Help us to respond to this advent in faith by confessing our sins now in the silence of our hearts. Amen. The Apostle John tells us that if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us and to forgive us of our unrighteousness. Know that on the truth of the Word of God and Christ's atonement on the cross, you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sent it on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated.
for the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Let's pray. Savior God, guide us now by your word and spirit that we might hear your truth, heed your call, and be prepared for Christ's return. We celebrate your first advent every Christmas, Lord, looking back. And now we look forward to your word. May these words of scripture now edify our minds and convict us through the Holy Spirit that we leave here not only as hearers of the word, but doers of the word as we enter into your kingdom. We ask these things in your Son's name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11, I'm reading verses 1, 1 through 10. Isaiah, of course, one of the major prophets, one of the four major prophets in, uh, in ancient Israel, major only in the length of their, 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 their writing, not necessarily in the importance of them. But Isaiah is writing about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And he refers back to, uh, he says here, the, the, the stump of Jesse. He's referring to Jesse, Jesse who was the father of King David, who was Israel's greatest king 3,000 years ago. And the prophecy says that from the lineage of David would come the Messiah, the Messiah Christ the Lord. And so yes, Jesus, descent comes through that line. Sometimes in the Gospels he's referred to as the son of David, only referring, of course, to his genealogy from, from that. What he's talking about here is not the coming of Jesus in the first advent, but he's talking about that great millennial kingdom, that kingdom that has no end, the kingdom of righteousness and justice and love and truth and, yes, judgment that will come when Christ returns in his next advent. And now the word of the Lord, Isaiah chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge for the poor and decide with equity for the oppressed of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion will feed together and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand in the adder's den. They will not just hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Here in a New Testament reading appointed for today, we are reading Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 1 through 12. This is the story that speaks about John the Baptist. John the Baptist as we know, was the cousin of Jesus, probably about six months older. John the Baptist is in the wilderness now, and he's preaching, he's preaching a gospel of repentance. He is preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. John has actually spoken of in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, when God says that in the great and coming day of the Lord, I will send my prophet as a messenger who will prepare the way for him. And this is what it alludes to now in this, about 400 years after the writing of Malachi in the book of Matthew here, the story of John the Baptist and his call to repentance. Once again, hear now the word of the Lord, Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. 
In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one whom the prophet Isaiah spoke of when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions around Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to, for his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able to raise up from these stones children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I, and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat in the granary, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. May God have a blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think most of us know when we reach a certain age in life that uh, many good things in life depend largely on our careful planning and preparation for them. If you don't want anything big to happen in your life, then don't do anything. If you want to fail at any task, then don't even try it. If you want things to fall through the cracks, all you have to do is just sit by and watch. The bottom line is that there is no gain, that there is no achievement or victory or success without intense preparation for it. And I think each and every one of us can attest to that fact in our own lives, that our own success has been as a result of how well we have prepared ourselves, whatever the task in life that we face. Well, Advent is that season, as we are in now, that invites us to anticipate and prepare for now 2,000 years later, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's a suitable time, I think, to reflect on the biblical promise of that coming kingdom. Since we look back and celebrate that first advent with Christmas carols and with hymns and with the child in the manger and all the traditions that go with it. But we know why Jesus was born. Jesus was born clearly with a mission to die, which of course is the Easter story. But I don't need to get ahead of myself. Easter will come in its own good time. The Advent message last Sunday taught us how to live. If you were with me last Sunday, he taught us how to live in anticipation of that coming kingdom. It was titled, The King is Coming. We learned that in this walk here on earth, we are only preparing for that second coming. And as I said in that reading, of course, no one knows the day or the hour, not even Christ himself. Not even the angels, but God himself. So we never know. We never know the time. But from that Romans reading that Paul I read from, he clearly said that we are to be busy. We are to be working. We're not to be a bunch of layabouts engaging in licentiousness and drunkenness and all kinds of things. But we're to be busy preparing the way for his second coming. No matter how difficult the journey may be, it means that we're talking about eternity when Christ comes a second time. And the importance of this, I think the message, is that since none of us know the day or the hour of return, since that scripture reading said you will come like a thief in the night, we're instructed to be busy, to be busy about the Lord's work. Today's Advent message takes that first step a little bit further. Not only are we to be busy knowing the King is coming, but we are to be preparing, preparing the way, preparing the way for his coming. Well, preparing is an event that takes on critical task in our lives. I think the first rule is that the giving of ourselves, we need to take and engage in preparation before we can even begin to try to accomplish a task. 
You know, only when we see input can we expect output. Only when we can deposit something can we expect a return. And only when uh, we participate, we can expect something to happen. And yes, sometimes with preparing, you've heard no pain, no gain. Nothing comes from nothing, and it never did. You know, you think about it. Uh, you know, a good career does, doesn't simply happen. Staying healthy is not uh, an act of nature. Financial security is not as a result of, of luck. And a happy marriage is never automatic. It, you know, it takes work. When we think about the world we live in, especially in this country here, the United States of America, the land of free, we live in something that some people would die for to inherit. But if we think about it, if we are to remain the land of the free, we must continue to defend our freedoms. And so consequently, giving ourselves to that task means there is a great deal of preparation in the body. So we know that without hard work and sacrifices, nothing good is ever going to take and be accomplished. And the same thing happens in preparing the way for the Lord. If we're to apply that topic or that idea of preparing the way to today's thinking of the Messiah coming, we must come to the conclusion without giving our total selves to God, we should neither anticipate nor have the right hope for the coming of the Messiah. Now yes, he may come in our lifetime, and, but again, God's timing is not on our scale. He may come a thousand years from now or a million years from now. We don't know. But regardless, he is coming. And only those who have made a conscious decision to believe in him, as I pray all of us have done here as believers, will ever be able to be of service and to sacrifice for his kingdom. That, my friends, is why John came in the wilderness. He was preaching. He was preaching to those Sadducees and those Pharisees, the people who were so self-righteous. They thought they had it all tied up in a neat little box. They thought they had it all sorted out. And yet, John knew that the corruption of the Sadducees and the Pharisees was such that he called them a brood of vipers. That was quite a judgment on John's part. Can you imagine calling people a bunch of snakes? Is that any way to win someone to Christ? You a bunch of snakes? Well, the second exhortation was that to be prepared, of course, they had to repent. And yes, that is the first part of our Christian call. When we reach that time in our, in our own Christian life where we realize that, yes, we're going in the wrong direction, we need to change direction, and that's where repentance comes in. And that's why I know that all of us keep short accounts with God. Yes, we confess our sins here on a Sunday morning. And we do that because God will not hear our prayers. God will not enjoy our worship of Him unless there's a clear signal of transmission. And sin blocks that. Sin blocks that signal. And so when we pray to God, even in our daily lives, it's important, and I'm sure you know, that we keep short accounts with God. We confess our sins, and yes, He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what's that mean all now if we drill this down? What's that mean for us here and now, this day, the second Sunday of Advent, 2,000 years later? How are we to prepare for the Lord's return? And by we, I mean right here, right now, this church, Northminster. Well, let's take a short tour, if you will. I came to this church a little over a year and a half ago in April, of April of uh, 2020. Your previous pastor had gone, and we were coming out of COVID, and your interim pastor, Steve Rhodes, had to leave because of, of medical issues. Your session contacted the Presbytery of Florida uh, Committee on Ministry, and they asked me to leave worship for, for three Sundays, after which they offered me a, a six-month contract. Well, subsequently, in May of this year, the Presbytery of Florida commissioned me for up to three years here at Northminster. Now, realizing I would be leading this church, hopefully not for three years, but realizing I would be leading this church for such a time as this, I came to the conclusion is how can I leave this church where I don't know where we're going? I might be leading you all off a cliff or into a ditch. And so I contacted the, the Presbytery of Florida's Committee on Church Revitalization. And I asked them if we could do the Holy Cow survey. 
to take an assessment of the church of where we are right now and where we aspirationally want to look to be in the future. And we did that survey last November. <laughs> Can't believe it's over a year now, but we did. And after that, in January of last of this year, you elected a church revitalization team to work toward those goals. And yes, they were very good goals. The first thing I wanted to do was build a sense of community in this church. And so I suggested that we have, lo and behold, a 30th anniversary celebration. The timing was perfect. This church was started in 1991. In October of 2021, we had our 30th anniversary celebration. But then I realized at that celebration that there was already a sense of community here. I didn't need to build community. You know, we had that in the form of our family life ministry, in the form of potluck suppers and church picnics and, and church cookouts. Now that's not the sugarcoat things. Yes, the past few years have been have been rough sailing. You hemorrhaged members and, and, and you lost income, but you were still engaged in community and family life and missions. So what did that holy cow, what did that holy cow reveal? Well, I'll read it. It says our church provides high quality education that is appropriate to every age and stage of life. I agree with that. The worship services at our church are exceptional in both quality and spiritual content. And I might add also in musical content. I believe you can agree with me on that, with our music program. Our church does a good job supporting persons in ministry by reminding them that they are making a difference. I think that's pretty true. And our church provides opportunities for education and formation in a variety of ways so that I can find one that fits my complex lifestyle. So think about those. Think about those goals. Well, the goals came back, and one of the goals was to provide more opportunities for Christian education and spiritual formation at every age and stage of life. So what did we do here? Well, when I came, I first began a 12-week study of the book of Hebrews in the fall of 2021. Some of you attended that, okay? Then I had a Lent and Lunch and Learn series this past spring where we looked at Lent and from Ash Wednesday, of course, up to Easter Sunday. I also began last spring the Bible from scratch, where we looked at the Old Testament over 14 weeks, uh, and we had 27 participants in that class on Thursday mornings. We continued that in the fall here, where we do the Bible from scratch, the New Testament, for 12 weeks, and we have 21 participants. And yes, that class will end in, in two weeks. Presently, I'm, I'm leading an Advent Lunch and Learn series that ends on December 14th. I'm now preparing for a Lenten, wow, well, Lenten, a Lenten Lunch and Learn beginning Ash Wednesday. Yes, that's going to take place in February. And it's going to look at Jill Duffield's book, Lent in Plain Sight. And that'll lead us in the six weeks leading up to Easter. About 20 of you have been attending the home Bible study at the home of Elizabeth Ortel on the second and fourth Fridays, led by Reverend Shuford White. Additionally, we have Children's Church, Children's Sunday School, when children attend. And friends, don't forget also that I have over 30 people. The trip's almost filled, as a matter of fact. I have over 30 people traveling with me next spring to Israel and Egypt, to the Holy Land. Many of you from this very congregation to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, the apostles, and the prophets. So I think we got the educational part of Holy Cow covered. That, my friends, I believe, is part of preparing the way. Well, how about spiritual generosity? It says here that uh, develop a spiritual generosity of the people to financially support the ministry of this church. Well, I preached three sermons on stewardship, encouraging us to pledge, tithe, and be generous in our financial resources. And I can tell you that our stewardship efforts were an outstanding success where we pledge the necessary amount to meet and, yes, exceed our budgetary needs. But our goal is to increase our financial stewardship to the point where we can call an installed pastor to meet financially the terms of call that our presbytery requires. We're not quite there yet. So, of course, keep your pledges coming in. We'll always be ready to accept them. Yes, 
We're much further along than we were a year ago due to your generosity. That, my friends, is once again preparing the way. You know, we want to reach new people for Christ, the third goal. This involves visibility. And I think if you look at our church, our church was a well-kept secret for years on Nine Mile Road. But not anymore. Look at our new sign out there. Wonderful, wonderful, that new sign. That increases our visibility. We also have a church brochure that describes the mission and ministry of this church that's available for us to take and give to others and tell others about our church. We have opportunities coming up here next week with our cantata. You won't hear me preaching, but you'll hear beautiful music, I'm assured. That's a draw right there. Invite people to come to the cantata. And our generosity and mission support I don't really know where to begin. Kurt just talked about the amount of, the number of pounds of food at Manor House that we prepared, that we brought in here. Dee Dee Flamenacker, the executive director, was here just two weeks ago. And she talked about the dedicated volunteers from this church every week and the generosity of this congregation. I think back to when, you may recall, Todd and Emily. Emily came. They were attending with us for a while, and she was a social worker, and she needed items for the elderly, for noble senior living. And we responded tremendously and generously for the needs of those elderly with bringing the things that were requested. And then I think about my wife, Judy, who has traveled to third world countries with Operation Smile on medical mission trips, performing cleft palate surgery on children in Bolivia and South America, and most recently, most recently in the Philippines and Asia. You responded overwhelmingly generously by providing blankets and stuffed animals for those children when they came out of surgery. The guard fellows, you may recall, missionaries that you supported to Brazil retired. And without skipping a beat, your session decided to continue international mission by supporting, and we adopted, a Presbyterian mission worker, Douglas Dix, who is working in Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian territories on the behalf of Mission Work. And we have a new mission project beginning after the first of the year, providing lunches on a regular basis at the Ronald McDonald House to parents of children who are being treated with childhood cancer. I can go on and on. Did I forget Thornwell or United Ministries? Yeah, my friends, preparing the way. I think we got that down pretty good. And the final thing, of course, is to make necessary, necessary changes to attract families and youth to our church. I believe that is the next, of course, and the final challenge that your church revitalization team will be working on with their facilitator, Linda Lovins. So, you know, I think as a church, you should all pat yourself on the back. You should be pleased and proud of the work that you have accomplished over the last year and a half. Yes, my friends, preparing the way is not easy work, but it's dedicated work. It's doing the work of the Lord, and that is what this church is doing. You know, without such task and preparation, it's impossible to make Christ experience a joyful return. But you know, it's an urgent task. The ultimate goal of this, the Church of Jesus Christ, is to expand God's kingdom through ministry and mission until he comes again to claim this, his bride, the church that he bought and paid for by his blood of atonement on that cross of Calvary. That's our mission and our ministry. And I think we do it well. Well, my personal belief is that in this church, that if Jesus Christ was to walk in those doors, if he was to walk in those doors right now, and if he was to take an evaluation or an assessment or take inventory of this church, I believe he would tell us, brothers and sisters, well done, good and faithful servants. Continue in the joy of your Lord. That, my friends, is our calling for ministry and mission. That, I pray, will continue to be our way of preparing the way for the return of the King. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well done, good and faithful servants. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Time gives us out of God's abundance. So let's respond now to the generosity of God with our abundant giving. Let us celebrate our morning offering by bringing our tithes and offerings to Him.
O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe, in your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you, and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but you still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us, and heal us from our unworthiness. Amen. Let us respond. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and of heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and the needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us the victory of life over death. And now, see that your right hand, he leads us into eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Praying the prayer the Lord taught his disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dear friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. It is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites all of those who trust in Him to this feast which He has prepared for all people to come. This is not the table of the Northminster Presbyterian Church. It is not the table of the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America. It is the Lord's table. And so all of you are invited. On the night which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, This is my body broken for your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, shed for your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Will the elders come forward? <laughs>
These are the gifts of God for the people of God, the body of Christ given to you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be a communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every time and place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Amen. now with the opportunity to take and pray the prayers of the people, our joys and concerns. <clears throat> Let's go to our Heavenly Father and pray. Let's pray. A wise and wonderful God, on this, the second Sunday of Advent, we note the needs of those around us and pray for various people, especially those among our fellowship that we have listed on our prayer list this morning. Make us mindful, Lord, of their needs, that your healing grace come upon them and comfort them with your peace. Lord, we think about the spiritually hungry. We think about people that are homeless. We think about the lonely, Lord, this time of year especially. And Lord, we think about those who grieve and mourn. But we pray, Lord, for the joy of doctors and nurses and health care workers. We pray, Lord, for those in our law enforcement that keep our community safe our first responders, our military men and women that guard our precious freedoms. Lord, we pray for college students taking final exams and the traveling mercies that they get traveling back home to their families when this semester is done. We think about those, Lord, who are lost in a sea of addiction. Break those chains, Lord, and give them your peace and give them your wholeness. To those, Lord, who do not know your joy and grace of God's good news of salvation, may this Christmas season, may this Advent time, convict them of the need for you, our Lord. Holy God, united as a family of faith and as your people, we lift these prayers up to you in your mercy. Hear them now and receive them, great God, and make us the vessels of your grace and love as we go into the community as light for the world. This coming week, Lord, we may be the only Christ that some people see. May we continue to be that model, that lighthouse in a sea of darkness, bringing others to a saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is Wild Alone, the Prophet's Voice. Please stand and agree before that closing hymn.
Friends, the Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Receive now the benediction. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy, is the only wise God with glory and dominion, power and majesty, both now and forevermore. And may that same God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his favor upon you and grant you his everlasting peace this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Amen.